everyone, Cleo here and it's time for another wrap up. So it is already time for the August wrap up. Time is flying by so quickly. I cannot believe that we are finally in the home stretch towards Christmas, my favorite time of the year. So it is time for my favorite season, almost, you know, we still have the majority of September before it's actually fall, but still. Uh, so, but without further ado, let's actually dive into the month of August. So in August, for once, I did a mid-month wrap-up because I had read eight books by the time we reached the midway point of this month. And so I was like, okay, need to do a mid-month wrap-up or otherwise this is going to be way too long if I wrap it up by the end of the month. But sadly, in the second part of the month, I only read three more books. But this does give me an opportunity to talk about those a little bit more in depth uh, and also as always I will also be including the haul section of this month into this uh, video so that we can see whether my total physical TBR went up or whether it went down. So without further ado let me quickly show you the books that are in my mid-month wrap-up so I will link that video down below in case you want more uh, more of my thoughts on these books and so that is Thin Man by Sarah Winman, Saga Volume 8, Saga Volume 9, A Series of Unfortunate Events Book 13 The Ends, I also read How He Disappeared by Jing Jing Lee, uh, White Rage by Carol Anderson, uh, Alone Together, Love, Grief and Comfort in the Times of COVID-19 by Jennifer Hout and The Seventh Perfection by Daniel Polanski. So for all of those books, head over to that video that I will put in the description down below, come back and find out my thoughts about the other books that I read this month. So for the three other books that I read this month, let me first start off with the first one, which is The Bass Rock by Evie Wilde. So this is another ARC copy. This one came out on the 1st of September in America. It was already out in the UK before that. So normally I think it will be available almost everywhere in English at least. Uh, and so in The Bass Rock we are following mainly like three women across different generations in this one uh, location in Scotland near the Bass Rock and so this dark gloomy rock is basically the background for this entire story and I think one of its main strength is exactly that atmosphere so there's very much this dark gloomy isolated dark atmosphere to the entire uh, book it's very much a cold atmosphere and the people within it are also very much cold you don't feel a whole lot of human uh, emotion human um, companionship there definitely are some cases of some nice like female female bonds that definitely do add warmth to the story but it's very clearly indicated that like the bonds between neighbors or the bonds between like uh, women and men are very much more uh, cold darker grittier relationships and at the blurb it will also say that it's very much a book about the violence enacted against women by men however I do definitely feel like that gives a very bad a very wrong impression about the book because there are indeed acts of violence by men against women but they are very much spread out in the novel you have some instances early on but then uh, like for a very huge chunk of this book it seems like nothing is happening at all and then at the end you do indeed get some instances of violence and there are some hints throughout that things will be happening but I definitely didn't feel like that was the center of the story or like that was even what the story was about because there was such a long part in the book where it was about nothing and I personally do like character focused novels more than I like plot focused novels but there really was no plot here for a very long time and clearly I do still need the bare minimum of a plot to drive me through something so I almost DNF'd it and this probably will go into an eventual books I should have DNF'd video because I should have ended it you know it did become easier to get through it in those final like uh, 100 pages of this novel but it wasn't worth me chugging through like 200 pages of nothing in order to get to that ending because there was also no sort of like feeling of the entire book coming together in the end you know sometimes you have to go through some like dollar 
more boring passages in order to at the end of the book sort of feel like it all came together, it all served a reason. In this case that didn't happen at the end of the novel, so I basically just felt it was a little bit of a waste of my time. The prose was beautiful, atmosphere was beautiful, some of the passages about what was taking place, uh, for example at the boarding schools of these boys, definitely did touch me, but I don't feel like I got enough out of this to warrant it. Next, let me talk about some of the good, better books for this month. So uh, I will next talk about Loveless by Alice Oseman, which you can see I annotated heavily. Uh, so this is a book about asexuality, basically. It's very much doing the rounds on booktube. A lot of people are recommending it, a lot of people are reading it. I personally definitely wanted to read it, though I haven't felt a draw into Alice Oseman before. Um, but I'm very happy that I finally read it. Um, so. I myself identify as somewhere on the A spectrum. I don't necessarily need to pin down exactly where I am or exactly label my sexuality, but I definitely know that it's somewhere on that asexual spectrum. And when I found out about asexuality, it really was like a light bulb went off and I had had all these struggles with my sexuality, with like not knowing whether I was straight, whether I was gay, because I didn't know anything else existed and I didn't feel like I was gay because I hadn't had any feelings for a woman but I also didn't feel necessarily like I was straight because I hadn't had any feelings like for a man either it just felt like the default setting you know um, so when I found out about sexuality uh, about asexuality there was really a moment in which I was like oh really that is a thing what I have been experiencing which is a lack of a sort of crush sort of spark or anything like that does actually exist and this sort of um, coming to terms with that reality is very much at the center of this book. So our character is very much a girl who is moving from uh, high school into university life and she sees this as a fresh start, which I definitely can, can relate to. I definitely also experienced it in that way. She feels like it's a way to let go of the experiences of her past, start over again, find the love of her life in those wild university days that everybody's talking about. But not only does she find out that those university, those typical university experiences that people are always talking about, you know, the parties, um, the uh, heavy drinking and things like that, aren't really for her. Uh, she also starts to figure out that maybe those traditional relationships aren't for her neither. So uh, throughout the book she will be struggling with coming to terms with her sexuality, she will be learning about asexuality, uncovering more about what it means, what the very different um, levels of asexuality are, but she will also have to struggle with the um, sort of wish for her to be anything but asexual because um, she herself is very is a ver very much a romantic and she very much longs for this sort of big romantic experience that she's read about in all of these romance novels all of her life but um, she has to come to terms with the fact that she has never felt that way and that um, this this concept of asexuality and aromanticism actually fits so well that she will probably never have those types of feelings for a person. And that is definitely something that she struggles with that scares her as well because there are no examples of like what a life of a asexual and aromantic is like, you know, what do they achieve, what do they accomplish. When all of your life you've been told as a female that your goal is to marry and have children, if you know that you're never going to have those romantic feelings, uh, what is your goal then? What are What is your life going to look like? So it's very much dealing with figuring out her sexuality, coming to terms with it, figuring out her future and where she wants her life to go from there. Um, my negative points about this book are very brief, it's just that it's so centered around this, this sort of um, discovery of her sexuality that I didn't feel a lot of a drive through the book anymore as soon as we got to the sort of like acceptance of her sexuality. So these final like 50 pages or so, uh, it's not like I was bored with the book or that I didn't like it anymore, but I didn't have that huge drive, that huge push that I had anymore, uh, the way that I had it at the beginning of the novel. It was also less recognizable to me at that point because it was less about her sexuality at that point. Another huge selling point for this one is friendship. There are beautiful friendships in here uh, and it's not just about old established friendships that get um, kind of challenged through this 
changing situations in university life but we're also looking at like uh, new relationships new friendships that develop through this university setting and the way that they can be just as powerful as these old long established relationships are and i very much love the way in which it looked at these friendships and the intensity of these friendships and showing how uh, friendships can be just as powerful uh, as a romantic relationship and so for people who are asexual who are a romantic if they make the choice that they don't feel comfortable being in a relationship, that they don't feel the need to be in a relationship, that doesn't mean that they have to be lonely, that doesn't mean that they have to be alone because they can have intense friendship bonds that replace that sort of romantic uh, love relationship that is more typically promoted within our culture, our society, our media. Uh, so I absolutely love this representation. I think everybody should be reading it, especially people in, uh, like in their teenage years should be reading this, not just because of the representation of the asexuality, but just because of the representation of different narratives, of the fact that your life doesn't have to follow this string does, doesn't have to follow this uh, cookie cutter pattern that is presented to us. Uh, it is not the case that you have to follow that road. There are so many roads open to you and it's absolutely fine for you to take a different one, uh, for you to want to take a different one. Um, so I absolutely love it for that. Uh, I should also point out it does have a lot more representation as well. There are multiple asexual characters here, so we do get different interpretations of uh, you know what it means to be asexual. Um, we also have lesbian representation, gay representation. Our main character is isn't the only one struggling with her sexuality. There is definitely also another character who is um, like figuring out what exactly her sexuality is and what her relationship to sex is. So I absolutely love this one. Uh, couldn't recommend it more. As I said, final part of the book just for me felt a little bit more like it was just there to round things off and like there wasn't too much merit in that section in itself. Just for me personally, I didn't get too much out of that final like 50 pages of the novel. But uh, apart from that, I really love this one and love the representation and seeing myself in it. Something that doesn't really happen all that often. And then the final book that I read this month is Clap on Your Land by Elizabeth Acevedo. Absolutely love this one. This one goes on the pile of possible favorite books for the year. So Clap on Your Land is another YA contemporary. I definitely think that Loveless is also a YA contemporary and not an adult contemporary. Could be wrong about that though. Um, but so Clap on Your Land is a YA contemporary. I don't typically consider myself to like YA contemporaries, but I should maybe go into more hard-hitting YA contemporary because apparently I like them. So Clapping Your Land is a novel in which we are following two sisters. They are half-sisters. They share the same father. But so one of them, Yahaira, is living in New York and is part of his real family. Uh, and so he spends all of his life with them. But one month every year he goes back to the Dominican Republic in her mm, idea it's just for business but basically what he does there is he goes to visit his other family and his other daughter Camino and so at the beginning of this book their father passes away in a real life uh, plane crash that had a heavy impact on the Dominican Republic and on the Dominican society within uh, New York within the US and so this book is very much about these girls dealing with the grief, having to process the grief over losing their father. Uh, and of course, this has a very different. Um, this is different. It's very. It's a very different experience for both of these girls, as like for one of them. The father is very much the absent figure that she longs to look, see once in uh, once every year. For uh, Yahaira, our other, ex uh, our other protagonist, she has had already uncovered certain truths about her father and his life. So it's about a mingling of grief over losing him, but also about having to deal with those feelings she was feeling towards him and realize, realization she came to uh, in the final months that she spent with him. Um, but apart from dealing with that grief, it is also, of course, about finding out the truth about their father and this other sister that they have somewhere and the sort of reluctance to get to know each other, but also the sort of beautiful relationship that can flow from that connection. Uh, apart from that 
already hard-hitting uh, deep subject matter uh, there's a lot more going into this as well there's a lot going into uh, the sort of cultural identity of the Dominican Republic so we get a whole lot of uh, information about the Dominican Republic as well as an insight into like the way in which the Dominican Republic is exploited and the way in which Dominicans themselves for example also work along with the system as a way to of course survive but um, that definitely I also already like but we also get more of a feel for like the sort of um, more traditional um, spirituality and healing powers of the Dominican uh, people and just the love for the Dominican Republic was so clear from this text uh, also from the character of Jehaira who is Dominican but she has never been to the Dominican Republic herself but she has been raised Dominican her parents are Dominican uh, but so she feels herself to be Dominican but she also struggles with that identity because she has never set foot on the Dominican Republic herself so it deals with the identity uh, in with identity in that sense of the word another thing that I absolutely loved in dealing with which was with um, girls having to deal with the outside world and the way men look at them. So these are experiences that I think every girl has had at some point in their life, unfortunately. So a lot of times in this book these girls will be feeling uncomfortable because they are uh, in certain situations where they are alone with men or where they're being stared at in a certain way by men and so I absolutely love the inclusion of that in this book um, though it definitely was very hard to read about it but it was brought in such beautiful language that I, it absolutely moved me because uh, I don't think I've said so before but this is a novel written in verse and uh, it had such beautiful language to it and not just you know like extremely flowery or something like that it just has a beautiful way of putting to words certain things that you that are difficult to put into words such as the way you feel in those moments the way you feel when a man uh, looks at you like that and the way how you feel like your body is no longer yours um, I absolutely love this novel I will definitely be reading the other works by Elizabeth Acevedo as well now and this just goes to show sometimes you need to put your prejudices aside and read something that you think is a little bit outside of your uh, regular reading taste and they can absolutely surprise you and blow you away because this is definitely a contender for a favorite read for this year But so let's now dive into the books that I uh, hauled this month. So in this month I physically read five books off of my physically owned TBR shelves, um, but I also added some books to it. So first of all I added Loveless, which I luckily already read. Um, so we can somewhat discount that one but sadly there are some books that I added so first of all I added The Gospel of Loki by Joanne M. Harris which is a fantasy retelling of Loki uh, so it is a Norse mythology retelling Loki is the trickster god within Norse mythology I have always had an interest in mythology but I will say that Norse mythology has had the least of interest to me and so I don't know too much actually about Loki except for his presence within uh, the Avengers um, you know series or whatever you need to call that so um, yeah I mean I'm interested to see whether that is actually somewhat like the story you get in Avengers you know the background story to Loki and, Loki and Thor or whether I'm going to be in for a full ride should have read this in August for the Of Queens, Witches and Valkyries book club which only officially starts in September but this one was a book that we chose for like our smaller um, group chats that we had in order to set up this group club um, this book club so yeah I definitely need to read this soon uh, and catch up on that next up I also purchased Desire by Haruki Murakami this is a collection of I think some four short stories by him all centered around love um, I like Haruki Murakami's writing a lot and so I haven't read any of his shorter works so I'm interested to dive into some of his short stories and see whether it's something that interests me or not next up we have Such a Fun Age by Carly Reed which is nominated for the Man Booker for the Booker Prize this year is just the Booker Prize uh, and so this is a novel all about race relations uh, in it we have a 
black nanny who's taking care of a white child. At the beginning of the novel, apparently, she takes this child to the supermarket um, because she still needs to get some milk or something like that, and she's accused of abducting the child. Now, I don't think there are huge repercussions to this scene, but it definitely sets the tone for what this story is going to be about, about the sort of like prejudices against black people, about the relationships between white people and black people, and I've, as I've been told, uh, it will make me as a white reader feel very uncomfortable. It's very much about how this, um, like her employer, um, does all of these racist things without realizing that she is being racist, and about all these sort of like small remarks that she feels are innocent but actually are very much hurtful and things like that. It was on my list of anticipated reads for 2020 and so I'm finally getting around to it because I don't know why I do that, why I anticipate a release and then uh, keep myself from reading it once it's there just because I'm still hesitant whether it's going to be as good as I hoped it was going to be. But and then the final book that I purchased is my current read, and that is More Due by Alex Phoebe. This is a fantasy novel by Galley Bagger Press, which uh, intrigued me immediately because they aren't a like fantasy publishing house. Uh, and I was introduced to this publishing house when I read um, Duck's New Report by Lucy Elman, a totally different book than what this one is. And the as far as I'm aware, uh, the other writings by Alex Phoebe aren't anything like fantasy related neither. So that also intrigued me a lot to see what type of fantasy he would be writing. So in this one we are following our protagonist called Nathan, who is a young slum boy uh, who is trying to get by. His mother has had to resort to prostitution because his father is very ill. And so he himself also uh, is struggling around trying to look for certain creatures within the mud to sell in order to help his family get by financially, in order to help buy medicine for his father. Now he has a secret because he also has a spark. However, his father and his mother, especially his father, constantly tell him he cannot use the spark. Uh, however, he does use it because it gives him an advantage to uh, find these creatures more easily and uh, one day he catches the attention of the master and a sort of power battle, a sort of game of intrigue ensues between the two. Won't go deeper into it because, uh, yeah, this is not a wrap up. But uh, yeah, I'm currently reading this one. As you can see, I also have already annotated quite a bit within this book. So yeah, looking forward to finishing this one soon. So yeah, that's it for my August reading. So I finished five physical books, purchased six. So one extra physical book on my physical TBR, so I'm going to try and stop myself from buying anything more in the coming months. I do have some pre-orders coming in. Um, but so in total I did read 11 books this month and so I do want to get a little bit more physical books out of the way and less audiobooks, but I do have quite some Booker uh, and Booktube prize books that I want to read in September. So. Probably will still be reading quite a lot of ebooks and audiobooks and won't be making such a huge dent in that shelf yet. But I still have four months to do it, so I still have four months for 22 more books. I'm hopeful that I can do it. But so, yeah, see you guys for the next one. Let me know down below if you've read any of these books and if you want to talk to me about them. Bye!